Yeah. So, um, and I'm sure there's some more, some more are going to jump in as we go, but I, I, conscious of everyone's time, I want to want to get started. So, with that, I don't think this guy needs any introduction to you, you <coughs> folks. But uh, we are we have been thrilled this year uh, to have Coach Petromala join the City Lacks board, and uh, and as expected, he has uh, come with a wealth of ideas of things that can help help us grow and help us. Uh, uh, help more kids. So we're thrilled about that. He, uh, he, you know, and you know, Matt and I well enough to know that once we get to know you, the first thing we do is ask you to do something for us. So the first thing we did was ask coach to, uh, to, to, to give us a clinic tonight. So I, I, you know, um, uh, he could probably tell us how he won the national championship, but I think tonight we're going to focus on stuff to, uh, to get us back on the fields and talk a little bit about, um, you know, where, you know, maybe some things we can do. And, and, and I think this is supposed to be interactive guys. So we want lots of questions from you, but maybe some things we can do now. I told coach the situation with what's going on in New York city and the fact that your kids have not been on the field. It'll be close to a year in another week, right? You guys had them for a couple of days and then that was it. So, uh, so that's a, it's a place where none of us have ever been before and, uh, and, and, and where we go from here and, and, you know, hope fingers crossed uh, the news gets better and we get back on the field. And I think also coach Bukowski and I have had, and Matt and I have had some talk about if the PSAL doesn't want to do something and is there an opportunity to possibly get kids on a field on weekends or after school programs, uh, not involved with this, the, the high schools. And so we can maybe save some time at the end of, uh, at the end of coaches, uh, a lecture to, to talk about that. If that's, if that's good with everybody, that makes sense. All right. So you've got, and, and by the way, just so you know, you can, if you want to send me a question through chat, you can do so, but you could, you're also, we're, it's a, it's a small group. So feel free to, uh, to jump in and ask coach a, a question whenever you want to. And without further ado, I will turn it over to the legendary Dave Petromala. I guess I have to send my check to John for that nice introduction. Uh, e e evening fellas. Uh, it's great to, to be with all of you. Um, I have to tell you, for me, this is something I was looking forward to. Uh, every opportunity I get to do something involving lacrosse right now, um, you know, I, I think I'm getting the better of it, um, given the fact that it's my first time in almost 30 years that I'm without my own team. Uh, so it's been a bit uh, odd. And I think it's probably very, the way I feel and what I'm dealing with personally is very indicative of the times and the stuff we're all dealing with. So, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here with you tonight. Uh, I wanted to thank John and, uh, and Matt Levine uh, for, uh, you know, for ha having me and, and affording me the opportunity to be a part of uh, City Lax. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't give a quick shout out to my uh, former player, Max Levine, who was uh, kind enough to, uh, uh, to approach me and ask me if I would be interested to do this. So um, I'm, I'm glad to be here with you tonight. Um, you know, we, we, we find ourselves in some really uncomfortable times right now. And, uh, you know, while we're all facing challenges, I can't begin to imagine the challenges that you guys are facing. Uh, John was kind enough to give me a, a sense for the challenges that you're facing. I, I didn't realize it's been almost 365 days since you guys have been out on the field with these kids. Um, I really can't imagine, uh, you know, how they feel. Um, so what I thought I would do is, um, you know, address the, the COVID situation first and maybe offer some simple ideas. And, you know, I, I can be as elementary as you need me to be tonight or as complicated as you'd like me to be. Um, I'm happy to do either. But I thought I'd start with maybe offering you some, some ideas to, uh, you know, that might help you deal with some of these challenges. Um, I've been working with a number of different college teams uh, and, and I actually spoke to a college coach today whose team was underway. They had two games under their belt, two wins, and now the school just shut down for two weeks. So imagine right in the middle of your college season, your, your things get shut down. And he was asking, you know, what would you do? How would you handle it? And, uh, you know, the challenge is you're not there to do this in person with them. Uh, but what I would say is you guys play a critical role in these young people's lives and, and your ability to communicate with them while maybe not in person is still there. 
Uh, you know, so the first thing I, I would suggest that every college is doing, every high school is doing, and, and let me share this with you. Um, I'm currently, I, I volunteer uh, at my, my boys' high school, so they go to boys' Latin. They're both juniors, um, and they both play on the team, and I volunteered to help out in practice. Uh, I won't help out in games, but I will help out in practice. And, you know, they've had challenges. And one of the ways they've met these challenges is via Zoom. So what we're doing tonight, I think, can play a critical role for you guys. Uh, my understanding is maybe 60%, 70% of kids are actually attending remote school. Um, and there's about, uh, you know, anywhere from 40, 30 to 40% that aren't. Um, you know, that's staggering to me. But my question would be, would they attend a Zoom meeting with their coaches? And my sense is you guys play such an important role in their lives that they would. And, you know, I think they all, most of them have phones and most of them have access on their phones, um, whether their phone or computer, they do have an opportunity to interact with you. And my point is simple. It is critical to these kids that you interact with them. Uh, you're some of the most important people in their lives. I know for me, my coaches were always the most important people. Uh, unfortunately, for, for better or for worse, the educators, the teachers weren't the most important to me. It was the coaches. Um, it was the thing I enjoyed most. And, you know, it's important to remember that you guys can still uh, interact with them, still communicate with them, and in my opinion, still have, uh, you know, a tremendous impact and add value to their daily lives. Uh, so what do you do with them? You know, I was talking to John earlier and I said, you know, one of the things you can do for these kids to to keep them excited about the sport, which, again, they haven't played almost a year to keep keep them engaged is to actually have them watch it. You know, one of the greatest tools in learning is, is, is the visual portion of it. And there's so much online now. And most of these young people uh, no matter what the socioeconomic background, have some access to YouTube. And if they don't have it in their home, there, there are ways to, to get it. Um, I would suggest that you encourage them, you know, to watch, go find a game that was a great game that you enjoyed. Um, you know, you know, the 1989 Hopkins-Syracuse game that I played in is one that, you know, I constantly hear was such a, integral part of you know getting some guys excited to play the sport find a game with your favorite team some of the better players and encourage them to watch it um, there's nothing better for a young person to, to do than watch the sport enjoy it it keeps them engaged you know better still do a zoom call with them and or a zoom session and watch a quarter together of a game that you pull off of youtube and just share your screen with them um you know, I, again, I think during these really uncomfortable times, these kids don't know how to handle themselves. They're, uh, I, w I was reading the other day, you know, we all need, we all need food and water to survive. The next most important thing that we need to survive is connectivity. We need to be able to connect with other people. Uh, you know, depression, suicide, all these things are at an all time high now because these kids are locked away in their, in their homes, their apartments, and they're unable to get out. So, you know, a weekly Zoom session with you to watch a quarter of a lacrosse game where you can actually talk about what they're seeing, get their thoughts, opinions, maybe point out some of the things that you were sharing with them a year ago, talk about the skills that are being displayed, uh, you know, talk about the fundamentals of the game, uh, whether it's on offense or defense, how some of the better players in the, in the sport shoot the ball overhand, not underhand, you know, just little things that are fundamental to our game that they're not having an opportunity with you to go out and practice. Um, I, I think that's a great way to do it. So, you know, that's one. The, the other thing is I, I, I would hold them accountable. You know, I think right now more than ever, people are thriving for accountability. They're, they're, they're looking for something to do and they're looking to be asked to do something rather than sit at home and, and do nothing. And, you know, no matter where they are, no matter where they live, there's a wall. 
There are there there are hundreds of millions of walls in, in, in New York City in the New York metropolitan area. I, I know they've got to you know practice social distancing. I know they got to be safe, but there's not one kid that can't go out on a wall with a mask on and throw the ball against the wall 50 times righty, 50 times lefty. I would challenge them to do it. You know, maybe even create a challenge where they have to be filmed. And, you know, whoever can get 50 righty, 50 lefty first, you know, know, I I don't know that they can win a prize, but they can win. And it creates competition. It creates excitement. Um, You know, again, these are all things that we were thinking about when I was still at Hopkins when this pandemic started. How are we going to interact with our guys? How are we going to connect with them? How are we going to be able to actually, you know, teach this game so that when we do get up and running again, we're able to be successful? And, and I know you guys have kids, you know, of all ages, varying ages. And uh, my understanding is most are JV and, and, and high school right now or JV and varsity. Uh, but I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, listen, yeah. here's the plan. This is what we expect. You know, and I, I've come across a saying that I think really is really important right now. Everybody wants to hope. You know, I hope I get better. I hope this goes away. I hope, you know, I can improve my stick skills. I hope I can make the varsity or we can win a game. It's really critical that people have hope. But the, at the end of the day, hope is not a plan. Preparation is a plan. And I think it's okay to ask these kids to still prepare. So create um, you know, a routine for them weekly, you know, if, again, if this is possible, whether it's soft stick or with their, with a real stick out on a wall, they got to do it three times a week. And, you know, whether it's three or four times, 50 righty, 50 lefty, 50 off the bounce, lefty, 50 off the bounce, righty, you know, again, you're, 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 you're kind of, you pigeonholed, you're strapped a little bit with what you can do. But what they can do is still go out and, and, and practice the fundamentals of the game. And, and I've always been a big believer. I've always been taken back by someone that had poor stick work. I don't understand how someone can have bad stick work because at the end of the day, all that takes is practice. It doesn't take another person. It doesn't take a ton of talent to have a good stick. You don't have to be big. You don't have to be strong. You don't have to be a smart player. You have to be a committed player. So, you know, during this pandemic, this is a great time for you to ask them to do something that a lot of people aren't asking them to do, which is be committed to something. So, you know, again, just a couple of suggestions through the pandemic. Um, you know, uh, the other thing I suggested to a college coach today was compete, create a game, you know, create a game that involves lacrosse. You know, ask them to do a little bit of research. Uh, Give them the name of a great player and ask them to go, you know, learn about that player and and, and find out what that player was good at and watch that player. I just think this is a chance if they can't actually be out on the field with you guys, you can still ask them or demand them to do some things that, you know, can benefit them so that when they do get back to you, it hasn't been one year or a year and two months since they've actually had their stick in their hand, since they've thrown it and caught. Um, John, I don't know if you have that uh, piece of film where we have the four four man passing. Um, maybe, do you have that? Let me pull it, let me see. Okay. So uh, this is just a, a drill, it, it, it's elementary. And I'm telling you, we did this at Hopkins during individual, all the time, individual work all the time. It takes four guys, um, it takes, uh, you know, if you can't find a field, you don't need a field. You can use a parking lot. If you don't have a parking lot, you need about 15 yards of, of space. And all, all they do is in, in a, you know, a 15, 20 minute period, social distance, they can actually work on their stick work. So if this will work, um, we'll see if, if, if John can show this to you. And if we could fast forward, John, through these guys probably don't want to hear me talk twice. So if we could fast forward forward through that, that'd be great. Just to the video. So and you can freeze it right there. So all this is is simple box passing. And I know, again, 
you guys are saying, well, you guys are really reinventing the wheel at Hopkins, Coach. No wonder you're not working there anymore. Uh, <laughs> this was simple, and you'd be amazed at how poor uh, the quality of passes are at times, how, uh, you know, poor what poor fundamentals guys have. So what we did in this instance, as you can see, guys are about 15 yards apart. We're teaching them, one, we're, we're using tennis balls. And the reason why we use tennis balls is because it's ch more challenging to catch a tennis ball than it is a lacrosse ball. Forces you to have softer hands. Makes catching a lacrosse ball, when you go back to it, much easier. Much harder pass with a, uh, with a tennis ball. So now you got to, you know, you got to throw the ball on a frozen rope. So we would do this, and if you do it for one minute, we would challenge the guys to get 100 touches, not each, but as a group, 100 touches and work on catching the ball across their body, pivoting, getting their stick up, and throwing a good quality pass with a tennis ball. So, John, if you let it run for a second, what you're seeing is actually good passes. And all it is is simple stationary stick work. So you can work on this at the lowest of levels or at the highest of levels. And again, we're going slow here just for yeah. a demonstration purpose. But if you do this for a minute lefty, a minute righty, and then you do a minute catch left throw right and reverse it into a minute catch right throw left, you know, those are – that if it's 25 touches a minute – that's a hundred touches those kids get and they're not even with you. So, you know, again, trying to find ways to drill the fundamentals of the game. And again, it's not like we're reinventing the wheel. We're not doing anything that's so complicated, but at the highest level to the lowest level, we all require the same things, sound fundamentals. So now we just got in a diamond and we're catching left, throwing right. And you see, they're working on now exchanging their hands rather than grabbing the stick. They're sliding their hands, you know, up and down, and they're working on a quick exchange, a good quality of pass, and they're getting 25 touches in a minute. Again, not requiring a field, not requiring a whole lot of space. Um, you know, if they can't find four kids to work with, you know, that, that are on the same team or in their neighborhood, again, you can social distance in this. You can wear a mask in this. You know, you're, you're, you're just practicing the fundamentals that you guys, I'm sure, have been drilling uh, for weeks. And, again, whether you're a high-level player or a low-level player, i got to be honest with you guys, our guys couldn't get enough of this. When we started this, you would be amazed at how lousy the passes were, how poor the quality of the, 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 the pass was how poor we were catching. We were dropping tennis balls all over the place. And now you see right there, again, everything's pr pretty good, pretty fundamentally sound, and it looks really good. Again, all, all in the course of five minutes, righty, lefty, right, left, left, right. You don't even need to – you can do this with one coach and put your whole team in groups of four. If they're really – you know, if the, the – uh, the level is very elementary. Well, then bring them in a little bit closer and make the pass a little bit shorter. You can take in the next step of this and get a lacrosse ball and throw bounce passes because catching a ball off the floor that's bouncing is much harder than catching it in the air. And you're working on, your again, your soft hands. And I don't mean to be disrespectful in showing you this. I hope you're not taking it that way. I mean, literally, when we went out and did individual work, this was the first thing we did as a warm-up. We got loose. We touched the ball a hundred times, close to a hundred times. You know, maybe you guys can create groups and challenge them to go out and who can get a hundred touches in the fastest amount of time. And one week it's one group they win. Well, you recognize them. The next week another group wins. You know, and now not only are you working on the fundamentals, but you're breeding a little competition and a little bit of excitement in regards to what you're doing. So, again, just a very fundamental drill that we did. Uh, I was at the U.S. Lacrosse Convention. I showed this to college coaches, to high school coaches, uh, to youth league coaches, and I think it serves a purpose at, uh, at all levels. So, um, John, if you want to go to the questions, I'm more than happy to, 
to address you know some of these questions now. Okay, I would also say, Coach, that that video we pulled off of YouTube, and if kids wanted to do, I mean, right now if they're not in school, they could do it with three of their friends, right? They could they could do this uh, on their own if they wanted to, right? So yeah, listen, listen, there's so much that these can kids can do on their own, and I would tell you, YouTube, you know, I I, I think the internet sometimes uh, it isn't such a good thing, uh, but in moments like these the internet can be a, a, a great teacher. I mean, you can go on there and you can basically find a ton of different drills for these guys. And you can go on yourself. You can find footwork drills for defensemen. I mean, Tucker Durkin, who played for me, uh, did some great footwork drills. Uh, you can work, these kids can go out defensively and work on approaches on their own. What most people don't realize, but on average in a college game, Defenders, a whole team defense makes anywhere from 130 to 150 approaches a game. Think about that for a second. 130 to 150 approaches to a ball carrier in a game every time the ball is moved. You think approaches are worth working on? You know, if, if it's the most, other than catching and throwing, it's the thing that's done most in the sport. Why wouldn't you work on it? Because if you take a bad approach, chances are you're going to get beat. If you take a good approach, you're giving yourself an opportunity to actually defend. That's on the internet. Um, ground ball play is on the internet. Face-offs. You can go online and kids can watch face-off technique. They can go out on their own and literally all they have to do is take their smartphone and pull up a, a free app of whistles. And they can put it down, whistle blows, and they can take 50 face-offs and use their te techniques. The simple point is that this pandemic, again, um, we, we, we shouldn't hope that we're going to get through it. We shouldn't hope that we're going to get better. In all actuality, these, these kids need to have a plan. And I think you guys recommending and encouraging them to, and, and challenging them, quite honestly, to go online, to, to look at these films, to watch some lacrosse, to enjoy the game itself, and then take some of these fundamental films that are available and actually go out, um, you know, it's the next best thing you have other than you getting on a Zoom session and, you know, and watching with them. So I hope that makes sense to everybody. You know, and then the other thing is I know City Lax has clinics online as well, so you can take a look at those. Uh, John, you want to you wanna go to the questions? Well, why don't we just, uh, while we got everybody out here, I know, I know Coach Wong sent in some, so. Anybody want to jump in with a live question? And if not, we've got a list of questions we could we could go with. So, yeah, yeah. please don't feel bashful. I'm happy to address drills, anything you guys want. Go ahead, Coach. Uh, thank you for coming out today. Appreciate it very much. I'm uh, Charlie Pikowski from Curtis High School, um, and um, you don't have to answer this question as much as maybe get back to us, like you know, um, later on. But the way you um, organized that drill, which is uh, the passing drill. If we can get as many drills like that, where we can get the kids like in game situations where they're working in groups, because a lot of us uh, where like the offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, goalie coach and, uh, sure. and the PSAL, the yeah. more drills we can get, the more tools we can put in the toolbox like that, where we can incorporate um, groups of kids at one time and setting them up in the field would be fantastic. I think for all, you know, all of the schools. Yeah, Charlie, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I'll actually try to get with my uh, former director of lacrosse operations at Hopkins and see if I can get him to send me some films. And what we could do is not only do give you some drills, but what we could do is give you some drills where you're doing more than one thing, where they're doing more than one thing. So in a drill, you can work on an approach, playing the ball, and a slide. Um you know, and, and you can do it while you're, you know, warming up the goalie. You got to have something while you're taking care of the goalie. All the other kids are able to do something, a simple ground ball drill. Um, I'm happy to do that. And, uh, you know, again, there's a there's a ton of them. Uh, and I would suggest, you know, as the, the level gets a little higher, you start to cre create drills that do more than one thing. So you can work on more than one facet of the game and you're able to work on two or, or, or three. So, you know, but I'll give you an example. Today at boys' Latin practice, we needed work on ground ball play. And the head coach said to me, do you have any ground ball drills? I said, yeah, I got a great one called Advantage Ground Balls. And all we did 
and you don't necessarily need to be there. All we did was we took two guys, one in front of the other. We rolled the ball out in front of them from behind, and they had to go work on a poke check or a lift of the backhand. Now, that sounds so fundamental and so foolish, and yet when we did it, it was amazing. You know, we first did it, and guys are starting to check, and they're, you know, they're slashing and whacking, and I'm like, fellas, the purpose of this drill is to be behind a, an offensive player and work on two, one or two things, poke their backhand or lift their backhand. And hopefully it will disrupt their ability to pick up a ground ball and they either run over it, run by it, and you get it, or they just miss it. And when we did it, like five guys did it in a row, and it was like a light went off. You know, these are kids that are playing at a pretty high level in high school across in the MIA, and yet they don't have great fundamentals, Charlie. So there are a ton of drills like that, that your whole team could do that in group in four lines and just go through it for, for five minutes, for 10 minutes. And, you know, the key is to teach them that these little parts that they're working fit somewhere in the hole. Happy to do it though. That's great. that will be great coach. Thank you coach. Appreciate it very much. Absolutely. Thanks for, uh, for asking. Yeah, we can send we could send those out to you guys directly so you can have them, and we can also probably post them on our City Lacks YouTube page so you can refer to them there too. What else? What else can I answer for you guys? Hey, hey, Coach Robbie Dunnigan here. Help out with Docs and City Lacks. Um, you've played and coached at the highest level, and from the outside looking in, we're really competitive when you were doing it. How do you change that? competitive energy when you're working with maybe younger kids or kids that are sort of starting out with the game and aren't necessarily at the level of competing in the same way? Well, good question, Robbie. And I would say, you know, competitiveness, it, it doesn't go away. It's not something you're able to turn off. At least I can tell you it's not something I can turn off. But what I try to do is rather than channel that in terms of winning and losing, I try to channel that into an energy that gets them excited about what they're doing. Um, clearly, you know, we, we, the generation that we're dealing with right now is, is very different than, than my generation and probably many of yours. Um, you know, and everybody's quick to say this generation is different and they're not good. And I actually think they're great. They're just different. And they're the, the what motivates them is different. Um, you know, with the, with, with the lowest of levels, Robbie, what I, I think is most important is, is teaching them what they're doing, but more importantly, why they're doing it, whether they're really young kids and or, or they're college kids. The what's important, the how's important, but what I've learned, and, I, and I'm telling you, this, I, I've learned this, you know, in the last few years, the why has become more important than anything else. And you, you think about kids and you say, listen, I need you to go, you know, do this. And he, the, it's always, well, why? And you need to do this. Well, why? Or how come? So, you know, with these kids that are really young, I think it's critical to be very, very fundamental, as you probably already know, very, very enthusiastic, and also just help them understand, you know, if you're picking up a ground ball, why do I want my backhand down? Why do I not want my backhand up? I, I think that why is really important. So, you know, you channel your competitiveness. And quite frankly, this is why, you know, I'm struggling with it with high school kids right now between you and I. Uh, I I've just gone from, you know, the pinnacle of Division One lacrosse to uh, a, a high school lacrosse team that, you know, like you guys has been in a pandemic hasn't played a lot of lacrosse and I, I'm about to pull my hair out. And, you, you, you know, look, at the end of the day, we have to be disciplined enough as adults to understand what we're dealing with. And, you know, at, at a certain point, the competitiveness has got to, you know, it's got to be put aside and the enthusiasm, I, I think the enthusiasm and energy are still important at the highest level. But the, the competitiveness has got to be put aside a little bit, and it's got to be about enthusiasm and creating a passion for the game with these kids because 
there's nothing worse than being a kid. I, I remember my son, Nicholas, uh, who's a defenseman now. Um, he's like, I don't want to play anymore. I, I, I stink. I can't catch and throw. And that's what he said to me when he first picked up the game. And I was like, listen, you know, I shared with him my, you know, my journey and that we were all bad at one time and that, you know, you, you improve by, by practicing every day. The issue becomes if they're not enjoying the practice, they don't, they don't want to do it. So your enthusiasm, your level of excitement, your passion, uh, it, it, you know, they derive a lot out of that. And then, you know, they have a hard time doing something that they don't know why they're doing it. So I think that enthusiasm, that passion, and the why are critical. I know that's a long-winded answer, but I hope it does answer your question. No, that's great. That's great. I mean, am I wrong? Are you guys all dealing with what I, what I dealt with in college? Every kid wants to know why. Right. Yeah, you know, you know, it's funny. The only difference is I wanted to know why when I was growing up. But I knew if I asked why, my old man would tell me because I said so, <laughs> you know, or I didn't have the guts to ask why, because I knew the answer wouldn't be real, real good. So, you know, we, we were all like that. The difference is for these kids today, asking why is acceptable. And to be honest with you, there really isn't anything wrong with that. As coaches, we should explain the why. I just think the why's become more important than the what and the how. How about who else? Coach Wong, have you got a question? Go ahead. I do. Thanks, Coach, for, uh, for being here. Um, Johnson Wong from Hunter College High School. Nice to meet um, you. I, I just had a question about um, defenses and systems. Um, like, pretty simply, when, when would you use a zone defense as opposed to a man-to-man -man defense? And – would you be sticking with just one system with your team or do you switch them up within a game? Good question. Good question. I think it's one that, that, that we all ask ourselves at, at every level. Um, you know, I, I, I was always a believer that more is more. And as I've gotten older, I've become more of a fan and a believer that less is more. Um, you know, I, I think it's really hard to move on to something when kids haven't mastered something prior to that, you know? So again, you got to decide, uh, you know, what's most important for you is winning most important or is teaching the game most important. And I, I, I find this to be uh, an important question at the club level, you know, all these club teams and, and, and you know, quite possibly some of you or many of you are involved all these club things have become about winning. It's about winning and getting recruited because if you win, the better players want to come play for your club. And if they get recruited, well, more good players want to come play for your club. And I always thought that club lacrosse was created to provide kids with an additional opportunity to grow and develop their game. You know? Uh, so I, I'm a big believer that, you know, before you decide you're going to go to zone, at the end of the day in a zone, you still have to cover a man. You still have to play the ball. And if you don't know how to play the ball, well, it doesn't matter if you play man or zone, you're in trouble. You know, so I, I still think you have to master the fundamentals and gain at least a serviceable and solid understanding of the techniques needed to play fundamental defense. So if you, if you play man to man, you know, well, where do you start? For me, at the lowest level, I started teaching how to slide adjacent, not from the crease. Because if you learn how to slide adjacent, you learn how to rotate. In order to rotate, you have to learn how to communicate all parts of what you're going to do in a crease sliding defense. When you slide from the crease, you have to rotate and recover. Well, now it starts to become a little bit more complicated. So, Again, when I was at Hopkins, when we started in the fall, we started with an adjacent sliding defense. We learned whether it was against uh, an offense that it was conducive to playing against or not. We taught how, how to, number one, how to play the ball and how to take areas of the field away and then how to support 
around the perimeter and how to rotate. Once, you know, and again, it didn't take long at that level. Once we kind of hammered that home and helped them understand the importance of being able to do that and how that fit into the next step, we'd move to the next step. So I think number one, you got to define, you know, what's your goal? Is it to teach them how to play defense or just to win games? And if it's to win games, well, if you're not good at what, you know, what's the old saying? If you, you know, the more you do, the more average you are, you know, the less you do, the better you are. Uh, so I, I think starting simple and then, you know, being able to, to look at it and say, okay, we may not have mastered that, but we have a sound fundamental understanding of this. Now we're okay to move on to, you know, B or the next thing. I hope that makes sense. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. I, can I have a recording so I can share this with my, my players? Cause they ask me a lot to switch things up all the time. And I like to kind of, well, you, you know, the, working the, on, you know? The, the <laughs> other thing to consider is, is, you know, is your personnel. And again, I, I'm coming from the highest level, um, you know, and our 2005 national championship team, that group was undefeated that year in 05, and that senior class didn't lose a game on Homewood Field in four years. Pretty unbelievable. And that group, we were extraordinarily complicated with. We would jump from man to zone, depending on if you were above or below the goal line. We would push certain ball carriers to the middle of the field and others down the side. We would slide and double some guys and slide and release for his others. And, and that's all well and good, but if we don't have the IQ to do it and we haven't practiced it during the season, we can't do it. So what was beautiful is when we played Virginia in 05, uh, we played them a certain way. We turned around two days later and played a completely different defense against the Duke team that was different than Virginia. The only reason why we could do that is because we practiced it throughout the year. Uh, and, and we were able to do it because we had, I mean, we had, you know, we had a kid on our team who had a 1590 SAT. That means he got one wrong. I mean, can you imagine? We picked on that guy all the time about the one wrong, oh, the one he got wrong all the time. But we had a really bright team. We had a very veteran team. And we had a very vet, experienced defense with a, with a veteran goalie. And because of that, we were able to do that, you know, based off of your personnel, you may be sure. Maybe you can get a little more complicated once you master something, but if you're, you're, you're not, don't have that kind of personnel, then, then less is more simple. Simpler is better. Thanks. Any other questions, guys, who else out there has got a question for coach? I'll jump in here. Uh, Coach, a lot of us have teams um, that, you know, we, well, we all do, but a range of talent. Yep. Uh, and, you know, you've got your top group of guys on the, you know, that uh, have their skill sets and so forth. And then it kind of trickles down. If you're trying to build a team, um, and how do you, how do you talk about personnel? Like, um, I'm going to uh, cite one specific ex example. Um, Max, my son, played on your team with a guy named Dave Spaulding. I know Dave came out of high school as an attackman, high scoring, highly regarded, and you made him a short stick defensive midfielder. Yeah, I remember that day very well. <laughs> and he's now a Navy SEAL. Yep. Amazing, amazing. Athlete. But the point is, is that you saw something on your team and how you were building it. And you said, this is a certain type of kid, certain type of athlete. And I'm going to, I'm going to move him there because that's a, that's a critical job that I've got to, I've got to fill. Uh, but if you got like a highly talented group of kids or a few of them, where do you put them? Where do you put your best players first? Uh, you know, that's a good question. You know, I think no, number one, is everything that we do, whether it's parenting, uh, whether it's, you know, sales, whether it's recruiting or, or coaching, uh, it's all relationship driven. And I think those relationships are critical 
when you're working with, with these young people. Um, they're certainly more apt to do things uh, that you suggest if they know you care about them. What, what's the old saying? They're not, they're, they're not going to care until they know how much you care. So I, I think, you know, for, for, for you to ask them to do certain things, whether it's change position, whether it's to s- assume a certain role on a very talented team, or, or, or a very, you know, a, a team that's minimally talented. I, I think the relationship that we as coaches have is critical. Um, if we want to be tough on them, which Matt, you know, I was demanding of my team, but I know what your son would tell you is he knew I always loved him. And whether he liked what I said or didn't like what I said, what he knew was what I was trying to tell him was in his best interest and the best interest of the team. So I think that's important. That's the first thing. You know, if you're, you're if you're talking about where do you put your best player, well, there's a lot of ways to look at it. If it's an offensive guy, well, you know, you might want your your best player to be on the attack because he's on the field the whole time. You know, he's not leaving the field, so he's there not only to help you in six on six, but he's there to help you in transition as well. If your best player is a midi, he might not be on the field. But your best player, if he plays at the midfield, can impact your team at two ends of the field. He can impact it on offense, maybe between, the, you know, on the face-offs or face-off wing uh, or, 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 you know, in the defensive end. I think it's really not specific to each kid and each kid's talent and, and each team. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, I, I think one of the challenges that, that we all face and that you guys face in particular is you probably have one or two kids maybe that are better than everybody else. And what happens is those kids dominate the ball. They take all the shots. They, you know, when they throw the ball, uh, you know, and a, and, a, and a kid drops it when he's wide open, they get frustrated. And I think the key is that we teach these kids, the word you used was team, is that this is a team, this is all about team. So, you know, the hard part is to teach a kid who's really good to throw the ball to the kid that's wide open when he knows well and good that that kid may not catch the ball and may drop it. But how is that other kid going to improve if the better kid doesn't throw him the ball? So, you know, our our challenge is to find, uh, you know, where each kid belongs, where can he be most successful, but maybe more importantly, Where can he help the team most? So Dave Spaulding's a great example. Another example is Corey Harned. Corey Harned came to, I inherited when I got to Hopkins. He was a freshman. The leading scorer, all-time leading scorer in Sachem lacrosse history, which is out in in, uh, Long Island. Sachem, pretty pretty storied high school lacrosse player. All-time leading scorer. We got there, and the first day I was like, this kid can't play attack for us here. He couldn't put the stick in his left hand if you paid him. The ball would come down the left side, and he'd catch it in the back right position, and we want to move it to the left side, and he'd throw it right back to the right. Or he, instead of dodging opposite and attacking opposite, he'd dodge right back to where it came from. And this went on for like two weeks. And finally we said, enough's enough. He, he can't – he's not an attackman. So we moved him to midfield because he was – an unreal athlete and we figured you know what this will be a little bit easier a little more space maybe fewer decisions we got him up at the midfield and offensively it was the same thing ball would come up one side he'd throw it right back where it came from so at the end of the year he walked in my office and I said well my friend I have a present for you I have a gift and he said that's awesome what's that coach I go here's three long sticks enjoy your summer (laughs) he went home and Corey Harned became an honorable mention All-American and a huge contributor for us. Point being is we as coaches are, are charged and challenged with finding where kids be, can be successful. So the last thing we can do as coaches is put a kid in a position where he can't be successful. It's not fair. We can only ask them to do what they're capable of doing. The other thing is we need to put them – where they benefit the team. And I've told my sons, uh, my son's an attackman. And this summer played on a club team 
where the head coach of the club team's son was a lefty attackman. Well, guess whose son didn't play lefty attack? And I looked at him and I said, well, pal, learn how to play midfield because you are going to be more recruitable, more versatile when you get to college if you can play two positions rather than one. He did it. He did it happily. Would have loved to have played attack, but point is simple. He became a better player because he did what was best for the team. Matt, I hope that answers the question. Terrific. All, on, all, on all fronts. Loved it. Good. Good. Anyone else? Charlie? Yeah, Coach, I got one more. And um, if you could answer it tonight, great. If not, again, you know, um, hopefully that we'll stay in, um, in contact with you, you know, through City Lex. Um, like, um, like Matt was saying, um, and I'm sure that everybody else is like in kind of the same boat that, you know, wearing at Curtis is that the majority of our players, when they come to Curtis um, as freshmen or sophomores, is the first time they're grabbing a stick. Um, so, you know, we're dealing with, you know, not only, you know, um, uh, our stick skills also, but our savvy. Um, and it, in, until we build that up, um, what we try to do is, uh, is take advantage of our athleticism. Because um, what I do is I try to get everybody who gets cut from the basketball team and drag them to lacrosse. And I coach football, so and I'm the defensive coordinator. So if you want to play linebacker and D-back, you have to play lacrosse. It's in the, written in the, in the ground rules now. Smart um, move. Yeah. And, uh, Very smart. And, uh, and I'm trying to get, like, you know, the soccer players because they're different because uh, they understand the concept of spacing. But if you can give us um, – because everything now is fast – you know, football's fast, basketball's fast break. And um, as, uh, I'm trying to incorporate as many different, like, you know, fast break drills to, uh, you know, as at least as, you know, if I can catch, like you said, if I can get, um, get a guy to catch one pass, you know, coming from a goalie and then use his speed, you know, for, for fast, you know, to, to um, establish that fast break or that fast tempo on offense and take advantage of our athleticism, um, that would, have, I think, beneficial to everybody. Um, because yeah, I, I, th I think you all probably have one or two kids that are just different than, than everybody else. And I would encourage you to take advantage of their gifts, their talents to help your team win. But I would also encourage you to encourage them to a great, simply put a great player isn't great because he scores a lot of goals or, or plays great. A great player by my definition, is one that makes everyone around him better. So how do you take advantage of that kid? Well, you know what? If you got a really athletic defenseman, well, maybe one of the things you do is maybe he doesn't have a great stick. But, man, he runs really well, and he's a basketball kid. He doesn't get run by. Well, then maybe what you do is when he's covering the ball, you can shut off a little bit or extend your adjacents a little bit and let him go to work a little bit like that. Maybe you got a midi who, uh, you know, clear, you know, is real athletic but doesn't have great stick skills but can run by people. So rather than getting complicated in a, in a clear, you do, you know, the old punt return. You know, you get him the ball and you, you clear out and you, you let him go. And, you know, if they slide up the field to him, you know, if he can run by him, great. But if he can't, you teach him – to make the right pass because what's going to happen to that kid is eventually he's going to go play against someone who can catch up with him, who can run. And then when he doesn't make the pass, he's going to lose the ball. You're going to give up a goal. Um, and, and it's a really challenging spot for you to be in. We do it at our level. Look at the end of the day, we don't play as many guys as we would like to. You don't want your best six offensive players off the field. So we keep playing them. We keep putting them out there. Because, you know, at our level, you know, we're required to win. I, I, I would just say that the challenge you face is what's enough and what's, what's too much. And, you know, you have to define as a coach what, what are those kids' gifts and how do you incorporate them into your team without alienating everybody else. So it's like playing basketball and one guy takes all the shots. Well, what happens is all the other kids stand around and watch. None of them learn how to play offense. None of them learn how to set a pick or a screen. And, you know, they don't want to play anymore because little Johnny's doing doing everything. I, I think I think that's a, a real negative. So, you know, in, in your instance, you know, I, I would teach that kid. I would put that kid in a position 
where there are certain spots where he can really help the team and you give him a little bit more freedom. And you ex- But you explain why you're giving him that freedom because the kids need to know why. Not that Johnny's the best player and we're going to give the ball to Johnny every time. But then you got to teach Johnny when when someone slides to him or someone doubles him that he needs to understand to move the ball to Jimmy. And Jimmy's never going to get any better unless Johnny's willing to throw the ball to him. Make sense? Yes, Coach. Thank you very much. Yep. Any other questions for Coach? This has been awesome, Coach, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Johnson, go ahead. Johnson won. Hey, thanks again. Um, So I've been coaching for a number of years now, and um, the program's doing really well. It's thriving. The kids are super engaged. They love it. Um, It's the best thing that's that's happened for me in in coaching and teaching. And um, in the beginning – I couldn't get a kid to have interest after high school. And as of recently, the last, you know, four years or so, we have kids that are now gaining confidence. They want to play. And this is for myself, not for my players. How can I help those guys um, get their names out there? Or how can I um, talk to coaches? How do, how do I get them represented, you know, and, 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 Sure. To, well, to take you know, there's talents, you know. Yeah, how do you, how, how do you help them move on? You know, yeah. so, you know, one of the things I think you'll find in our sport, the beauty of it is, you know, we're, we're, we're still a, a small sport and uh, I, I think every most people have a pretty, pretty good sense of humility. Um, I don't think, you know, too many coaches take themselves too seriously and think they're above and beyond everybody. So the simple answer is, is to communicate. If you have a kid that you think is a division one player, a division two player, a division three player, a junior college player because of his grades, it's really simple. You get online, find the co- research the coach, send him an email, pick up the phone. Any coach worth his weight in gold is going to respond. Anyone that doesn't, you know what, the hell with them, then you don't want your kid there to begin with. Listen, we all want to win. We all want the best players. So if I have a coach that calls me and says, listen, coach, I- I'm at a school where we- we've we never had a kid go play Division One. I. I don't know if this kid is good enough. He's great for us. Would you mind taking a look at him? Can you tell me, is he good enough or is he not? What level do you think he's at? And I think you'll you'll be really uh, pleased with the response that you get, whether the coach does it himself or he has an assistant coach review it. I think we're fools if we're not helping our associates. Um, you know, you never know where you're going to find a player. I mean, M- M- Matt referenced Dave Spaulding. Dave Spaulding's team wasn't a high school team. It was a high school club team. Like, they were not a sponsored varsity lacrosse team like most of the public schools in the state of Maryland. They were a club team. But you know what? He was a fabulous athlete, and he was a Division I athlete. He wasn't a Division I offensive player. But when we looked at him, we said, you know what? He's a Division I athlete. We can find a place for him. And if we didn't take the phone call, we would have never found, found out about him. You know what? Good question is, if we didn't take that phone call, he didn't go to Johns Hopkins, he didn't play Division I lacrosse, would he have been prepared and ready to able to be a Navy SEAL today? Good question. All because we accepted a phone call or someone reached out to us via email or via text message. So I, I would tell you, ask the question. If you're not sure, Ask. Pick up the phone, ask me, ask a guy who's played at a high level. Hey, what do you think of this kid? Ask another coach, say, look, I'm not sure. What do you think of this kid? Is is, is he good enough? What level do you think he's at? But I I think you would be doing yourself, your program, and most importantly, that young man, a disservice if you didn't just 
communicate and reach out. And look, even in football, it's happened. How many guys in Texas that play, what's it? Seven man football, I think. It, it's, it's not 11 on 11. It's seven on seven. Well, those guys aren't playing quote unquote real 11 man tackle football. But how many of those guys have gone in on to have great careers in college? Because a coach was willing to watch a film. A coach was willing to take a phone call, go watch them. You, you know, you don't have a video camera. You can't get your games film. Then you know what? Find a parent. They all got cell phones. Have them record the game on a cell phone. You know, do whatever you can to, to help your program, to help your kid. And once you do it, you start to get a sense, well, this is the Division One guy. This is the Division Three guy. This is the Division Two guy. You start to build some credibility with the college coaches. But I don't think you'll find someone who would say no to you when you say, I don't know if this kid's good enough or not. Could you please take a look at him? Here's, here's his film. And if you can't provide a film, then you say, look, I can't provide a film. We're not able to do that. I don't know if this kid's good enough, but I wanted to put him on your radar. This is where he'll be. He'll be at this event or this event. And if you can get those better kids to an event outside your area, great. There are scholarships available all over the place. We scholarship one or two kids to our five-star event that normally wouldn't have had a chance to go, couldn't afford to pay for it. And we just said, you know what? We're crazy if we don't give this kid a chance to come to this event and measure himself and get film on himself. Thanks. I appreciate that. Absolutely. I'm not sure. You know, it's funny. I'm sitting here. I don't feel like I'm helping a whole lot, but uh, hopefully, you know, some of this is, is transferable. It is. Dave, uh, let me add, let me add something to that. Um, I know there's the showcases and everything you, 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 uh, you, you work for a company that runs some great uh, five star that runs some great events. How uh, are college prospect days also an another good way to try to get the kids seen? Uh, I realize it's a different kind of setting than a very highly competitive showcase. Yeah, well, I think you gotta be careful because a lot of those are money grabbers. Um, you know, I hate to say that, and I hate to say that about our sport, but coaches are trying to find ways to generate uh, income for their assistant coaches. So, yeah, we might have a prospect day, but the prospect day's got 250 kids at it. I, don't, I can tell you what at Hopkins, we weren't recruiting 250 kids. So, you know, no, no, why go to a prospect day when there's 250 kids? I, I think what you got to figure out at what level the kid is at. Yeah. And then once you do, what is he interested in? Is he interested in, you know, maybe you got a kid that's just special, that's really bright, doesn't come from a, real, a great financial background, and, you know, pick up the phone and call. Call the event and say, listen, I got a kid. Do your scholarship. Um, you know, the college coaches can't do that. So you got to really be selective. Maybe he's interested in a really academic school. Um, find a NESCAC school or an Ivy school and see if you can find a way to get the funding and send them to that prospect day. You know what? What a great way for him to, to get noticed if he's on a college campus. You know, now he's not going to be able to do three, four, and five of those, but, you know, he can do one or two of them if, if you're able to get him the funding. Um, I just think you got to be careful. Uh, you know, there's kids that are trying to go to like 10, 10 of these things. I'm going to go to Hopkins, Virginia, Syracuse. It's it's not worth it. At some yeah. point, enough's enough. I, you I'm know? thinking more Division Three uh, prospect days, which I think are a little bit less. You know, you don't they don't have like the hundred. Yeah. You, you know what I would do, Matt? To be honest with you, I actually think there are a couple really good Division Three events. They're they're events run by Division Three guys that, when you look at the listings of what coaches attend. It's Bowden, it's, uh, uh, it's Bates, it's a lot of the NESCAC schools, it's Washington and Lee and York College and um, Gettysburg and those kinds of places. And not hard to do a little research, but if that's the case and you got one event to go to, I want to go to the one event where there are more Division Three coaches than any other event. 
And that way I have an opportunity to perform in front of NESCAC schools, uh, lower level academic schools, depending on you know where I am academically. But I can, I can be seen by any number of Division three coaches, uh, you know, Haverford, um, again, Bates, uh, you know, you know, division three schools, there, there's more of those than anything, quite frankly. And if you can find an event that has the most, co- co- most division three college coaches in attendance, I would go to that more than I would go to any one prospect day because you have an opportunity to be seen by more. Good advice, coach. Thanks. Well, we're, we're over an hour here, so I just want to see if anybody has any final calls. I appreciate everyone's time tonight. And I know Coach Bukowski wants to talk a little bit about what do we do if uh, with the PSAL, so we'll, we'll leave it open for that. But uh, there's not any more questions for, for Coach Petromala. Uh, I just want to make sure we get that part closed. I probably will stop the recording, and then we can talk about what to do about lacrosse this spring. I guess my question, John, has this been helpful in any way, shape, or form? Absolutely, Coach. 100%. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much, Coach. Listen, j- j- just uh, for you guys, um, you know, I'm happy to have John share my email address. Um, uh, I'm happy to help in any way I can. Um, sadly, I'm not quite as busy as I, I would like to be or I used to be, and hopefully we'll busy- be busy again very soon. <laughs> Um, but if there's a need you have, a question you have, or a kid you're unsure of, and you want to send me something to look at, I'm happy to help you guys in any way, shape, or form. That was one of the things that, that I told John and Matt that I would, I hoped I could bring to the table for, uh, for City Lack. So please don't, please don't hesitate to use me as a resource. Awesome. Thanks so much, Coach. This was really great. Great. I wish all you guys well. Uh, I'm sorry you're all dealing with such uh, challenging times, but hopefully uh, things will get better. But I wish you and your teams and your kids well. Thank you, Coach. Thank Much you. Thank you. Too, John Coach. and Matt, thanks. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Coach. Thank you, Coach. Thanks, Coach, again.